It's been said by some of the great theologians that I had the honor of studying in seminary that what makes a church is two specific things. Um, when you come into the church, you say, what makes this gathering of people any different of what happened at the you know, Ohio State game or the Michigan game or what will happen in uh, you know, the Browns game or uh, Bengals game today where just tens of thousands of people or hundreds of people come together? What makes that different than this? And a lot of people could have a lot of different answers. Well, you know, here we, you know, come in, we, we sing, we pray, we, we have the Bible, and there it's football or whatever. And that's kind of what these theologians were thinking through. What makes this time and this space different from other times and spaces where people gather, even people of Christian uh, belief and heart? Well, what the, John Kelvin said was two specific things. What makes the church is the church is the word of God is preached, that when we gather, we look to the Bible, and it is preached, it is opened, it is understood, and it is the authority in our life and in our practice and our rule. And then what also makes the church the church is two specific elements, communion and baptism. Communion and baptism. So preaching of the word of God and the sacraments or whatever they were called in the ordinances, whatever they were called in your tradition of communion or the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, whatever you called it growing up, there's got a lot of names for it. It's the same thing. Or baptism. And communion and baptism are not these things that uh, can just be done in any old circumstance. Preaching of the word cannot just be done in any old circumstance. That when the church gathers, we believe that there's a level of spirit empowerment for preaching of the word, both for the preacher and for the hearer. And in baptism and communion just aren't any old thing, but rather important steps of faith and action that God meets his children in. Now, some of you grew up in traditions where you took communion or the Eucharist every single week. If you grew up Catholic or you grew up Lutheran, you took the Eucharist every single week. You took communion every single week, and it was a central part of your service. If you grew up in a denomination like mine, I grew up in the United Church of Christ, we took communion on weird, a weird schedule. It wasn't like the first Sunday of the month. It was like certain church holy days that you took communion on. And then some of you didn't grow up in the church at all, so you you didn't grow up taking communion. You hear this word communion or the Lord's Supper, and maybe you understand that it's got something to do with the bread and juice or uh, wafer and some wine or whatever the tradition was, but you might not really know where it fits into the church or why do people think it's so important or why is that one of the elements that some believe make a church a church? Well, today, no matter your background, we're coming to this spot in Mark where it's commonly called the Last Supper. It's where Jesus celebrates this first communion, the Passover meal, with his disciples. And we're going to read about Jesus taking this final meal with his disciples. And my hope today is that no matter your background on communion, you're going to come away today having seen it specifically from the text and understanding it a little bit in a different way. Today, I'm not necessarily going to try and dive into the theological underpinnings and outriggers of communion, but rather walk us through the Word of God so that you can have an opportunity to see that. We're going to be in Mark 14, uh, starting in verse 12, and I believe we are going till verse 26. The text will be on the screen, or you can go there in your Bible. On the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples and said, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar will meet you, a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and say to the owner of this house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room? Where am I to eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready, he make preparations for us there. The disciples left and went to the city and found things as Jesus had told them, so they prepared for the Passover. When evening came, Jesus with the twelve, while they were Jesus with the twelve was with the twelve, while they were reclining at the table eating, Jesus said, "Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one of you eating with me." They were saddened. And one by one, they said, Surely you don't mean me. 
It is one of the twelve, Jesus replied, one who dips the bread in the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him to have not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then Jesus took the cup, and he made, he, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, Jesus said. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day I drink in the new kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The text opens this day with telling us that Jesus needed a place for his disciples to prepare for the Passover. Now, the Passover both was and is a very important holiday for the Jews. It's been celebrated for thousands and thousands of years, and if you go to Israel today, if you look at um, Orthodox Jewish people today, they still celebrate the Passover meal. It's a time where they set aside time to remember. Now, some of you are familiar with the Passover. Some of you are not, so it's actually really important that we get on the same page for this. And so the Jews, what are they celebrating? Well, there was a time where the Jewish people, God's people, found themselves as slaves in Egypt. For centuries, they toiled under harsh rules of pharaohs, the, the men who ruled Egypt as godlike kings, at least they thought of themselves. And the Jews were toiling under this until God raised up a man by the name of Moses, who became an instrument of freedom for God's people. Because Pharaoh's heart was hardened, he refused to let the Jews be free. And there's this common refrain, and maybe you've heard it, Moses would go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, and the Pharaoh would say no. And because of this, God began to send plagues upon Egypt to reveal his power and to show that Pharaoh must let God's people go. And each, as each plague began to show God's power, Pharaoh's heart continued to harden. The final plague was undoubtedly the worst. It would bring death upon the Egyptians. It's a form of punishment. Moses, though, instructed God's people, the Jews. He said, there's going to be a plague of death coming upon the land. What you need to do is take a spotless lamb and sacrifice it unto God. And take the blood of the spotless lamb and you're going to put it on your doorpost. Essentially, covering the home. And that night, when the angel of death comes upon Egypt, it will pass over you and your home. It will pass over you because the blood of the lamb, the spotless lamb, the sinless lamb, the perfect lamb, the angel of death will pass over you. And you will live, not because of anything you've done, but rather because the blood of the lamb that covers your home. So the Jews did this the angel of death comes upon Egypt and it's horrible for the Egyptians. But death does not fall upon God's people because of the blood of the lamb on the doorposts that covers their home. So every single year, the Jews would celebrate this. They would remember this because this is the plague that finally Pharaoh says, go, get out of Egypt. A lot of other fun stuff happens. You should go read about it in the book of Exodus. That's Craig's Cliff Notes versions. Back to Jesus, all right? Jesus and his disciples make their way covertly into town. Remember, at this time, people were trying to arrest Jesus. So they make their way back into Jerusalem, where you have to celebrate the Passover. And Jesus begins this meal on a note of awkwardness. Imagine I got up on a Sunday morning and just looked at you and said, one of you is going to betray me. One of you in here is going to betray me. Get a little awkward, wouldn't it? get a little uncomfortable. Now imagine someone does it at Thanksgiving this year. There's only 12 of you, and some of you are like, that actually will happen at my Thanksgiving. Thank you for making me freak out about that. But Jesus is sitting down with his disciples, and he's going to have this Passover meal, a celebratory feast, where they celebrate the angel of God, or the angel of death passing over because of the blood of the Lamb. And as Jesus is sitting with these 12 men that are supposed to be the most loyal of his whole following, he says, one of you is going to betray me. 
text says, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who's eating with me. And then this disciples reply in verse 19. They were saddened, and one by one they said, Surely you don't mean me. Each of them, all of the disciples, sit there and protest. Surely you don't mean me, Jesus. You say someone's going to betray you, but surely you don't mean me. And this is an important note, church. While there was an indeed a man at this table named Judas, who would go on to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, each of the disciples in their own way, within the next 24 to 36 hours, would also go on to betray Jesus, to deny knowing him. Peter, most famously, standing at that bonfire in the courtyard, is asked, don't you know Jesus? Aren't you one of his disciples? And betrays him three times. A text we'll see coming up. So Jesus is eating this meal with men who claim to have his back, who claim, I'm all in. Surely you don't mean me. How could I betray you? With men who, when their loyalty is questioned, say, I will never betray you, Jesus. We have in our minds at times when it comes to the church that the disciples were perfect. You know, Peter, James, and John, a lot of us grew up calling them Saint Peter or Saint James, Saint John. And we've seen these imageries or graphics of them with halos around their head and here they are eating this meal with Jesus and we think, man, this, this was the perfect group of guys. Yeah, Judas was a bad apple, but the rest of them, they got it. This was the perfect group of men. You ever think that? The disciples had just as fickle a faith as you and I? They saw Jesus do miracles. They saw Jesus walk on water. They saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And yet within 36 hours, all of them would turn their back on Jesus for fear or cowardice. Next, Jesus takes the elements before him. He takes the bread and he gives thanks to it. And he breaks it. He says, this is my body, take it. And a lot of symbolism happening here. In the days where ahead Jesus would be whipped, he would be beaten, he would be broken. His body literally broken on the cross for you and I. When Christians take the bread or the wafer, whatever you grew up taking, or if you've ever taken it, The idea is to remember the body of Jesus Christ broken for us. The church has always held that the weight of our sin, the weight of our betrayal, the weight of you and I being at the communion supper, the last supper, and actually being the kind of people that we betray Jesus. The weight of that betrayal. The weight of believing one thing and doing another. The weight of our sin, the weight of our rebellion. It cost Jesus everything. He was broken for our transgressions, pierced for our iniquities. The sin tab that we ran up was so extreme, Jesus crushed for our rebellion. Next, Jesus takes the cup, takes the wine on the table, gives thanks to it, and says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Now this is where context becomes so important, church. Remember back to what they're celebrating. The Passover. Remember why they're celebrating. Because the blood of the Lamb, death, passed over. And for thousands of years, the Jews celebrated the blood of the Lamb, the perfect and spotless Lamb, covering them and passing over them. And Jesus says, when you take this cup, you will remember my blood, spilt for you. My blood that inaugurates a new promise from God, a new covenant from God. My blood which covers my people from the angel of death, and it will now pass over you because of me. There's a scripture in the Gospel of John, John 1, 29, where John the Baptist and Jesus' cousin and a great figure in all the New Testament and Bible, frankly, Jesus is coming to John, and John looks at Jesus, and he says this in John 1, 29. It says, the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him, and he says, Look, the Lamb of God 
who comes to take away the sin of the world. When you and I take the cup or drink the juice, we remember Jesus as our Passover lamb, whose blood has sealed a promise between God and his people. Sorry. Whose blood has sealed a promise between God and his people. This blood, it's far stronger than any handshake or head nod. It's far stronger than anything we could just agree to or legal contract. It's why we can't break it. If you've taken communion with us before, you've heard me say something as often as we take it is, you cannot out the blood of Christ. You cannot run so far, you cannot dig your hole so deep that the blood of Christ can't cover you. When we take of the cup, we remember that God's promise is not sealed by our behavior, but rather the blood of our Passover lamb. This night, this meal, is something that the church has had at the core of who it is for some 2,000 years. To take the bread and remember Christ's body broken, to take the cup and remember Christ's blood poured out, communion, the Lord's Supper, Eucharist, it has had many names, but it has always served as a reminder of what Christ went through and as a vehicle of God's grace into our lives for all those who partake. As soon as we, excuse me, and we're going to soon take communion together, but before we get there, I want to just point out a few things to you from this text. Because I want you to remember them as you approach communion going forward. Because when I grew up, and, and frankly for, for a lot of churches, including Salina First before uh, COVID, when we served communion, we would do so in kind of a very formal way. The elements were served on very formal trays. They were, you know, gold cladded, or, you know, at least looked that way. And growing up, it seemed like the fanciest time. It almost felt like when mom got out the china. Like, just don't look at it, don't touch it, don't go anywhere near it. And the kids didn't get to use the china, at least in our family, right? It's like, we've got the Rubbermaid plastic plates for you. The adults are allowed to use that. And communion can almost feel that way. That it was a meal for the perfect. Everything's perfect about it. So the Christians that take communion, they must be perfect too. They, they never mess up. They have perfect church attendance. They have no backsliding. They have no sin, no nothing. Everything's perfect. But remember who took part in the first communion. Remember who takes part in the first Lord's Supper. Judas and Peter and all these other disciples who would abandon Jesus. Who, when the going got tough, they got going. The Last Supper was populated by Jesus Christ and a bunch of traitors and cowards. The Last Supper was populated by you. The Last Supper was populated by me. We're right here in the scriptures because all of us have at times been a traitor or coward to the God we say we love, to the God we say we follow, and then in our actions or in our words or in our thoughts, we do not. We betray the values we say we have. So when we come to the communion elements, when we take communion, we don't do so, church, because we are perfect, but we take them precisely because we are not perfect. Church, hear me and bury this truth deep within your heart. Communion is a table of, gr of grace, not merit. Communion is a table of grace, not merit. No one earns the right to partake. No one is perfect when they partake. We can't earn God's love. It's a free gift. We can't earn Christ's sacrifice. It's a free gift. Now, just because we receive it as free doesn't mean it wasn't costly for Christ. We ought to take communion and not do so in a flippant manner. The scriptures warn us against taking communion with an unworthy heart, which means we not ought to come in and think it's snack time. It's why I haven't had my children take communion yet. I don't feel they're ready to kind of process through what it means. My kids are young, eight and five. Because I want to make sure that when they come to communion, they understand the weight of the cross 
They understand the weight of the blood. So when we come to communion, we don't do so flippantly. But it also means that when we come to communion, we don't come so with pride and think, ah, communion. Well, I mean, I could take part. I don't really need it. Kind of have all my ducks in a row. If Jesus was making a varsity squad, I'd probably be picked for that. No, communion is this weird time for Christians where we come in simultaneously knowing we're not perfect, recognizing that we need grace, recognizing that we need Christ's love and peace and grace and mercy in our life, but then we also come in thankful and trying to strive and walk towards Jesus. We come in this beautiful mix of sinner and saint, knowing that you can walk with Christ with boldness because you are a child of God, but knowing that you need grace for today, yesterday, and tomorrow, and all the days of your life. Taking communion, for me, and I believe for many in the church, has often been an opportunity to put a line in the sand, so to speak. To bring your heart in a stillness before the Lord, to confess, to ask for forgiveness. Communion serves as a holy touch point as we remember Christ's body broken for us and the blood that covers us. And communion is a vehicle and a table of grace into our life. Communion reminds us of God's love for us. Communion reminds us of our own love for God. And lastly, before we take communion together, I would love for you to remember this all the days of your life. Because of the blood of the cross, the blood of Christ, excuse me, someday the angel of death will pass over me. As often as you take it, you ought to remember that Jesus is our Passover lamb. And while we have all at some point, we, oh, excuse me, and while we will all at some point set aside our earthly tents and in the hands of Almighty God will go our spirit, we know that death is not the end for those who trust Christ. And because of the blood of Christ, we can look down the last battle of death with confidence and hope. For those who die in Jesus Christ know that this world is not the end, but rather eternity waits. Some of you, if I'm a golfer, there's 18 holes in golf, and when you make the turn and golf, you just pass hole nine and you're going on a 10, you know you're about halfway through. But about somewhere on the back nine, you know that you're coming up towards the end, so you start to think about, what do I want to get my score? How am I trying to get it? Oh, okay, and if you're anything like me, you're like, thank you, Lord, there's only two more holes. I'm terrible at this game, yet I keep coming out here. Life is a little bit like golf, and some of you know you're somewhere on the back nine when it comes to years in this life. You don't know what hole you're exactly on. Tomorrow's not promised for anyone. But you know that you're coming towards the clubhouse, and I want you to see in your future, if you know you're nearing that, and the truth is it could be for any of us, I want you to always have in your heart, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, death will pass over me. As a pastor, I want you to always have heaven in your future view. A lot of us live very blessed lives here on this earth. So it can trick us into sometime believing, man, if God has blessed me this much here, I kind of want to stay here. I kind of want to be here. Church, this world is not your own, and because of the Passover lamb, you have a hope that waits for you in heaven. And every time you take communion, you have this opportunity to think of heaven, to think of loved ones past who worship Christ in perfect holiness this day, and to think of what awaits you this day. What a beautiful gift communion is to the church. A meal of grace for you and I. An opportunity to stop and repent and reflect and remember and rejoice in Jesus Christ. An opportunity to remember that our fate and our future is secure, not because we're good enough, but because Jesus, the Lamb of God, has come to take away the sin of the world. Take away that sin. We mustn't let communion become a commonplace activity in our hearts. We mustn't let our hearts fall by the wayside in worship. It should be something that we regularly engage with and share with one another. It's a great uniting meal of the church of grace and mercy. A great time to remember.